I'm back! So the last video was pretty heavy, um, particularly for me making it. So I make these videos when I'm not at work and I have a lot of fun doing them. I like filming, I like editing, I like talking about these topics, and it's usually just a nice little break from the stresses of the world. So because of the subject matter of the last video in my free time, I was just kind of burying myself deeper and deeper into stresses of the real world. All in all, I am proud of that video. I'm happy with how it turned out, but it did take a toll on me to make. So our guest host is back, everyone. Hi, say hi to the people. And one thing that absolutely never ever fails to make me happy is Kitchen Princess by Natsumi Ando and Miyuki Kobayashi. I initially read these when I was like 13, and let me tell you, this is the most ideal adolescent girl book series of all time. The artwork is so cute, the drama is so melodramatic, there's a love triangle, there's fashion, it's ooh! It's genuinely impressive how this story is so cliche that it pushes right to the border where it should be the most boring thing you've ever read, but then it pushes right past it and becomes the most absurd thing you've ever read. Kitchen Princess isn't that popular, and it absolutely burns my heart that so many of you miserable chumps have never experienced the euphoria of reading this as a 13 year old girl. But you know what? That changes today. I am going to show you the magic of Kitchen Princess. If you want to improve your life and have a lot of fun, here, take my hand, I'll be your guide. But if you're only interested in stories that are like, good and like well-written and interesting, then you can go ahead and skip this video if you want. But like, I don't know, I just, I really hope you learn to love yourself someday. Initially at this point in the script, I wrote like, and if you guys like this, maybe I can make this a series. But then I realized like, I don't care if you like this, you're getting a series. This video will only be covering the first book, but in future videos, I'll be able to cover more per video. It's just that we have a lot of characters and exposition to go through. This is a really complex series. You have to have a really high IQ to enjoy Kitchen Princess. So without any further ado, I introduce to you Najika Kazami, the Kitchen Princess. Our protagonist, Najika Kazami, is a delightful orphan living in Hokkaido, a rural area of Japan. Both of her parents were world-famous professional chefs, but they both passed away, and so she grew up in the orphanage. Also, Najika is an amazing cook, so she, like, inherited their cooking skills. It's hereditary, I guess. The book begins at a going-away party for Najika. She's going to be leaving the orphanage to go to the prestigious Saika Academy for gifted students. Despite not having much money, she's received a full-ride scholarship to the Academy for culinary excellence. So one of the things that you should know about the series Kitchen Princess is that it's rated T for teen, meaning that it's recommended for kids 13 years and older. Another thing that you should know about Kitchen Princess is that it is relentlessly wholesome. There is no swearing, there is no sex, there is no drugs, there is no alcohol. One character smokes cigarettes, but the story constantly reminds you that it's bad that he smokes and it's bad for him. Like, they're not glamorizing it at all. I think it's in, like, book 10. A character hands Najika a drink in a cocktail glass and they, like, go out of their way to say, Don't worry, it's not alcoholic. I'm not old enough yet. So why, if the story is so wholesome and appropriate, is it rated PG-13? Well, the writers decided to touch on some more serious topics, like a loss of a loved one, bullying, grief, eating disorders, that kind of thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with media aimed at kids and young adults touching on serious topics. As long as it's handled responsibly and effectively, it can actually be a good teaching experience for them. The problem with Kitchen Princess tackling these topics arises because, and I say this with peace and love, the author fucks it up worse than I've ever seen anyone fuck up before. They handle these delicate topics with such meat mitts that at times it unintentionally becomes the most offensive thing you've ever seen or the most hilarious thing you've ever seen. Absolutely the lowest point in the entire series is when they try to like tackle a very serious topic and give advice that could genuinely be dangerous for kids. Uh, we'll talk about that in the future. In the meantime, I'm going to give you a little trigger warning that in this next segment, I'm going to very briefly discuss suicide attempts. Um, I'm mean, not gonna go into any details, but if you want to skip it, skip to this timestamp. The first clumsy example we get of Kitchen Princess trying to like handle a serious topic is in a flashback. Najika is remembering why she has always dreamed of going to Psyche Academy. We flashback to when she was 10 years old and her parents had just died. 
and she's at the orphan and she's crying by a river and she falls in and she's about to drown but oh, a little boy pulled her out and saved her and so the little boy's like are you okay and Ajika who might I remind you is a 10 year old at this point says why did you save me I wanted to fucking die so I could be with my parents we just witnessed a suicide attempt. But luckily, that problem is solved with the power of friendship because the little boy gives her a flan and that cheers her right up. And she's totally fine that her parents are dead now. She's just vibing. The boy, who she calls the flan prince, runs away before she can thank him and get his name. But he leaves behind a silver spoon that has the emblem of Psyche Academy on it. All these years, she has saved the spoon as a good luck charm. This is Najika's core motivation. She studied hard for her entire life so that she can get a scholarship into Psyche Academy and possibly find this boy and thank him for saving her life and find her flan prince, as she calls him. So she tearfully says goodbye to her foster family and goes off to the big city of Tokyo to start this new chapter of her life and find her flan prince. They walk, they talk, they shimmy to the music they So let's talk about Najika as a character for a second. Um, you know the trope in media of the Pollyanna character where it's usually a little girl who goes through adversities but she has such a positive attitude and she comes out on the other side stronger than ever and she makes friends and brightens the lives of those around her? Well, Najika Kazami owns Pollyanna. She is Pollyanna. Over the course of this series, she goes through so many like fucking life ruining events and she just has such a positive attitude that she always overcomes them. She's so relentlessly kind and patient and optimistic, it's infuriating, but it's also hands down my favorite part of the series. It's another one of those instances where it gets right to the edge where it should be unbearable to read and then it pushes right past that and becomes amazing to read. Also a little warning, at this point the pacing ramps up to like 100 miles an hour. And so if it sounds like I'm going fast, it's because I am, that's how it's written. We're about to meet, like, the entire main cast of characters in the course of one chapter, so buckle up. So Najika's a simple country girl, she's never been to the big city before, and so she arrives in Tokyo in this big, like, comically poofy dress with a matching bonnet. I guess this is, like, her Sunday best. And so she's just running around the city all starry-eyed, like, Wow! These buildings are so tall! You can buy coffee from a vending machine here? There's so many people! I hope I don't get lost! So she arrives at the academy and is shown to her room and then she immediately decides to jump out the window to climb a tree. And sitting under the tree is a brooding dark-haired boy named Daichi. So through comical hijinks, she falls on top of him and tries to introduce herself and he's like, Bitch! I already hate you! I am a moody teenage boy and there is no way you're gonna melt my heart of stone. We'll see about that, Daichi. We will just see. So Najika and Daichi walk into the school and they walk past a cooking class where a female student has just made a flan. But she like sucks at flan and so it looks terrible and she offers it to Daichi and he's like, Tuh, no way, I don't like sweet things. Also, I'm not eating someone's failure. <laughs> it makes this poor girl start to cry like he's just such an asshole. But then our third principal character enters the scene. Sora! He's Daichi's blonde popular brother. He's also the student body president and you can tell. So Sora's like, Daichi, be nice. Just give this girl's flan a taste. And Daichi's like, no way older brother, we are nothing alike! And smacks it out of his hand. It's so dramatic. At this point Najika's had enough of this bullshit and she's like, okay, that's it. Baking montage time! And so Najika helps this girl remake her flan and she's so kind and patient and teaches her like all these little tricks of baking and they try it again and it comes out perfect! Okay, so I'm clowning on this series but one thing that I absolutely unironically love is the artwork, specifically the artwork of food and cooking. You can tell that the artist cared and took a lot of time in it. Like they'll set aside whole pages just so they can have this like beautifully detailed, shining picture of a cake and it looks so real that you can just touch it. Like they're able to convey that the food tastes good just by looking at it. It's actually very impressive. At this point Daichi does try it and he's like, Tch, I guess it's pretty good. I'm still not letting anyone cheer me up though. And then Sora is like, oh, Najika, you're the new student that the director of the academy was talking about. As a class president, let me just say, Welcome to class A. And he kisses her on the cheek in front of everybody, oh my god! Remember when I said that this is like the ideal prepubescent girl fantasy comic? This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> So let me explain class A really quick. Basically, all the students in class A are extremely gifted or skilled in an artistic area. Like, Najika's skill is obviously culinary. 
Others are like musical prodigies or really good painters. One girl's skill is modeling. We will get to her later. We also learned that Daichi's skill used to be basketball, but he quit that and he doesn't want to talk about it. It also should be noted that pretty much all the students at Saika come from rich families. They're basically nepotism babies. And so when Najika shows up and she's just this like poor girl who worked her way in, they're all like, ew, how did this country bumpkin with a heart of gold get in here? Let's bully her. So on the first day of school, Najika walks into class and her assigned seat is next to Daichi. And he's just like, ugh, of course I have to sit next to you. Why can't I just brood in peace? But just then, our fourth principal character walks in, Akane, a beautiful popular teenage girl who Najika instantly recognizes because she's also a famous model. That's her skill. She's the one whose artistic skill is modeling. Anyway, Akane was childhood friends with Daichi and Sora. She obviously has a crush on Daichi. Daichi hates everyone. Are you keeping up? Later at lunch, Najika accidentally bumps into Akane, spilling water on her and making her drop her lunch. And in response, Akane throws her to the ground like a professional wrestler. Like, girl, it's water. But Sora stands up for Najika and Daichi suggests that Najika can make her a new lunch, which she does and it's awesome and everyone loves it and they stop bullying her for like 15 minutes. But Akane fucking hates that Najika is getting a lot of attention from her classmates, especially from Daichi. I'm sure you've already picked up on this by now, but like, Najika is the most persecuted human being who has ever lived. <laughs> everyone in the school hates her for everything that she does. Jesus Christ mid-crucifixion was getting less hate than Najika is at any given time. They hate her because she's poor, they hate her because she's nice, they hate her because she's good at cooking. But also the bullying is very inconsistent and sporadic. Like everyone will be like, fuck you Najika, go die, but then she'll bake something and they'll be like, wow, Najika's so talented, we love her. The bullying kind of lessens as the series goes on, but for the first few books, it's just relentless. So aside from being an adorable walking train wreck, Najika also stands out from everyone else because she's poor and everyone else isn't. And so she's like, I need to get a part-time job in order to be able to afford things. And Akane shows up with absolutely no ulterior motives and suggests that she apply to work at this place called the Fujina Diner. I love this part because after this conversation, Akane goes, we're friends, aren't we Najika? And friends are supposed to help each other. But then when she turns her back, she makes his face like, this becomes Akane's thing, by the way, like this scheming face. Like aside from the beautiful artwork of food, I think my favorite art in the series is just this face, which she does constantly. So the Fujita Diner is owned by Mr. Fujita. He used to be a very successful chef, but those days are over. And now he has no motivation and his diner is falling apart and he doesn't even enjoy cooking anymore and he smokes cigarettes. <laughs> and so when Najika shows up and applies to work there, he's like, ugh. Fine, but you better not motivate me to become a better person. Don't worry kids, it's a fake cigarette. Smoking is bad for you. Another aspect of Najika's character that I guess I forgot to mention is that she's invasive as hell. For example, so she's working at Fujita Diner and one day Sora walks in and the two of them get to talking and he reveals to her that when they were younger, he and Daichi used to come here all the time for desserts, but because of very personal family issues, the two of them barely talk anymore. And so Najika says, now this looks like a job for me. And so she lures both of the brothers to the Fujita diner at the same time, parent trap style, so that they can like have tea and cake together. And so the two brothers actually talk again and it's a sweet little moment. So unrelated, but at one point she has to make a delivery to Saika Academy and it's for Daichi and she walks in on him when he's changing. Oh my god! When I tell you that as a 13 year old girl, this image was the hottest thing I had ever seen in my life. I remember reading it and I was like, oh damn, I hope no one sees me looking at this. So skipping to the end of the semester, it's Christmas time and it's apparently a tradition that Psycho Academy at the end of every semester hosts the most needlessly complex winter pageant. It's like part prom, but part like the students showcasing their talents. I have no fucking clue how they would be graded on this. That doesn't fucking matter. The important thing is that whoever like wins the pageant gets a special prize. Akane is going to be presenting kind of a fashion show. Sora is going to be playing the piano. And when Sora's like, Najika, I sure hope you can make it to the pageant. The other kids are like, <laughs> what's her talent gonna be? Eating? <laughs> like. Fuck you. <laughs> so Akane approaches Najika with absolutely no ulterior motives. 
and asks her to be part of the fashion show. And she's like, could you also bake a special Christmas cake that we can present at the end of it? And then she goes, of course, like, yes, bestie, I'd love to. This prank is so needlessly complicated. Najika shows up to the rehearsal in her dress with her cake and she sees that they already have a cake and everyone's like, why would we want your cake, bitch? But of course that's not enough. So they also like, push her to the ground and rip her dress off? Like, did Stephen King write this? So after this, Najika and Sora kind of have a heart to heart and she reveals that she's having doubts if she made the right decision coming to Seika Academy, considering that literally everyone wants her fucking dead and she misses her foster family. Sora comforts her and is able to convince her to stay. And Najika's like, but now I don't have anything for the winter pageant. And Sora's like, hmm. I think that we can come up with something. So it's the night of the pageant and Najika's not there. And Akane is sure that she's finally broken Najika's spirit enough to keep her away and like possibly make her drop out of school altogether. And now all the attention will be on her. But Akane doesn't realize that she's overlooked one thing. She's made one fatal error. And that is that she didn't realize that she was dealing with Najika fucking Kazami. Our girl bursts into the pageant in a Santa costume and she's baked a billion little star-shaped cookies and she puts them on the tree and everyone's eating them and it's the best thing they've ever had and Akane is fucking fuming. Every book in the series has one of these like completely unrealistic, huge triumphant moments in it and it never gets old. But it turns out that the prize is a silver spoon with the Academy emblem on it, just like the one that Najika has. So fucking of course she drops her own spoon and everyone's like, she stole the prize. And Akane, fucking steps on it. Worst Christmas ever. <laughs> so at this point, everyone's leaving for winter break, but Najika isn't because she's afraid that if she goes back to her home in Hokkaido, she won't be able to bring herself to come back to the academy. Oh, I just realized I skipped over like a crucial plot point because I was so busy focusing on the girl fights at the pageant. Sora and Daichi's father is the director of Saika Academy. He's like the dean or whatever. Not only that, but he's away on sabbatical and so in his stead, Sora has taken on the position of substitute director. This 14 year old is the Dean of Students. What are you doing with your life? Sora and Daichi are both massively rich, um, but Daichi refuses to live in their mansion. And so he lives in the dorms because he can't fucking stand to be around his father because of family issues. Anyway, our love triangle returns to the Fujita diner where they're all gonna hang out. And Sora and Daichi are talking. They see that she left a note saying that she's fucking leaving the academy and giving up on her dreams. No. Oh my God. I wonder if this is how the story ends, especially considering there's nine more books in the series. They're totally nude. <laughs> so that was my intro course to Kitchen Princess. I hope you learned a lot today, class. This is so nostalgic for me and it makes me so happy just to talk about it. I know that it's cheap. I know that it's a melodrama. And if you don't like it, I don't fucking care. It's called camp, bitch, look it up. Like I said, in future videos, we will be able to get through a lot more of the plot per video since we've gotten through the bulk of the exposition of the Kitchen Princess cinematic universe in this one. Anyway, thank you so much for listening and letting me info dump. I hope all of you and your families are happy and healthy and financially stable and safe. I hope you have a good day. Thanks for watching. Bye. They're totally nude. Uh, uh. They're totally naked.